was sort of a mad, crazy genius sort of a guy who believes in the First Amendment. Mark is very brilliant, very brilliant individual. Uh, I believe I heard a story about how he redid a computer system when he was in sixth grade. He has an opinion. He doesn't hide his feelings. I think Mark Dugan is an outstanding person because he took on the most powerful agency in this county, arguably the state. If you look at it from a biblical analogy, Mark was the David, and he was fighting the Goliath. It's a, fa yeah, it's a family kind of thing. We're stubborn Irish, you know. I mean, it's a, uh, you know, if, so if somebody pits huh? We're going after. I mean, it's just the way it is. Because Mark spoke out against corruption on his shift. But when I didn't like Mark Dugan very much, absolutely. Have there been times when I really, really thought he was a great guy? Absolutely. Hi, my name is John Mark Dugan. I'm a former Marine, former cop turned whistleblower. After my home was raided by American intelligence agencies, I snuck out of the United States into Russia where I obtained political asylum. Today, I'm still wanted by the American federal government. A man they know as Bad Wolf. Dugan operated a blog where he spilled details about PBSO's dirty laundry and inner works. Mark Dugan has been the sheriff's most contentious critic for years. Dugan went too far. His website began featuring nasty comments about Galga's family, the sheriff's right-hand man. Ex-deputy's website remains a thorn in Palm Beach County Sheriff's side. FBI raided PBSO critic Mark Dugan's house. Agents search for evidence of hacking and computer crimes. The price of truth. How one American ex-cop and whistleblower found refuge in Russia. Charlie Hotel. I, I went into police work in um, 2002. I was bored, actually. I was, you know, I had been in the Marine Corps before that. And um, now that I was out of the Marine Corps, I needed something to do that was more adventurous than office work. And uh, police work was definitely interesting. You go in for your daily lineup. Does he know you got a suspended license? Which guy? The Patterson guy. I don't think so. Well, what the hell? I'd be furious if I brought my car to a shop and they let some dude with a suspended license drive it around. That's just wrong, brother. But after that, you just start going to different calls. You taking this? Mm -hmm. and, and the calls could be, I mean, it could be a child abuse. It could be uh, a domestic. It could be a murder. You just, you know, you never knew. I'm not sticking with body I'm not selling no drugs in the corner of that, sir. Okay. You know, I understand I did violate the law by driving on a suspended license. I'm taking you, and I'm towing the car. I don't really got a choice. Uh, as a police officer, you know, my opinion is, you know, finding uh, f finding creative solutions to solve a myriad of, un of uh, uh, unique problems. Here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm gonna let you out of my car, okay? And I'll let you be on your way. However, I'm still towing the car. Yeah, I'll let you get him out. And God's decision to let you out of this car, man, it's mine. 
I always believed Dugan was a credible person. I mean, he's he's got a strange personality, but um, I've ne I don't think he's ever lied to me. I think he's always been forthcoming. Uh, he's always answered the questions that I was asking him, and uh, I think that he was mostly right in his uh, in his battles against law enforcement. The first time I noticed something wasn't right in police work was pretty much when I first started. Uh, I went to work in a small municipality called Mangonia Park. So in the video that you see, I was assigned to the, uh, the DEA, which is our drug enforcement agency. One of my jobs was to um, conduct surveillance on the drug dealers, figuring out who they were uh, uh, selling narcotics to and um, you know, making sure that the other people knew exactly what they were buying. And of course, I would wear a ghillie suit and I would be in the bushes, you know. We're gonna try something new. Yeah. 40 yards away, uh, just right across the street. Uh, blue pants. Dope to Mark Harry. After a while, you kind of get to know all the drug dealers, who they are. Um, yeah, sons of mayor, um, sons of other council people, uh, nephews, nieces. It's uh, it's it's like um, it's like an entire criminal organization. The corruption in Palm Beach County is not something that you can smell or touch or anything like that. It's more sort of subtle. You know, it's it's a nod and, and a wink. The expectations of the police chief were that we shouldn't be arresting these people. We should let them deal their drugs and we should park in the parking lots uh, just to make sure that no rival drug gangs would come by and, and shoot them. It was very bizarre. I had requested a transfer to follow one of my friends out to um, the city of Belglade, which is a really, really crime-ridden part of uh, Palm Beach County. It's a tough neighborhood. There's a lot of drugs. Um, they're mostly minorities. It's hard to work there, and they assigned him there because he was a good guy. He could get things done. We had a guy by the name of uh, Brent Rayban. He was a sergeant, and he he had a small group of guys, and he would just run around, just brutally beating minorities. Show show me where you got cut. They were just simply physically abusing African American citizens. It was beating the snot out of them. And to wear a hat where he called himself the Punisher. That's pretty pretty sadistic. After they would beat them and they were sufficiently bloody, they would take their photographs and post them on uh, Facebook and write captions like, you know, how they fell down the stairs. I took the screenshots from Ray-Ban's Facebook page and I sent them to uh, Internal Affairs. They, uh, they didn't want to investigate Ray-Ban, so instead they started investigating who sent the postings who's ratting out these cops that are running around committing these crimes. And of course they found me. Some of the deputy sheriffs who absolutely love Mark for what he did. And there are those that uh, can't stand him. So I have two children. There's Kelton, he's my eight-year-old son. And my daughter, she's 10 years old. Uh, Aureli is a really great gymnast. And my son has uh, 
Uh, I like to say he has my brain. He's a, a very smart kid. Um, not saying that I'm very smart, but you know, maybe, maybe a little bit. But he's really incredibly smart. He does my daughter's homework. That's how smart he is. And they're just really wonderful kids. I miss them so much. My kids live in Palm Beach Gardens uh, with uh, their mother, uh, my ex, uh, Kelly. I haven't seen them in two years. Like I think about it all the time. Like I haven't seen my kids in two years, you know? It's like I'm missing their entire life. And they're missing growing up with their dad. The hardest thing for Mark when he left was, you know, leaving his family, leaving his children. Uh, he, that broke his heart. So I left Mangonia Park, and I think it was uh, 2005, and I went to work for the uh, Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. Well, Palm Beach is one of the uh, wealthiest communities in the United States. There is a good reason why Donald Trump, you know, lived there for a long time. It's because he is with people like him who are billionaires. His big home uh, called Mar-a-Lago in central uh, eastern Palm Beach County. Sylvester Stallone has a home there. Bill Gates has a home there. Many, many, many people have homes in Palm Beach County. And everybody is rich. I think the the smallest house on the market right now is $2 million. That's the smallest one, and you probably have to fix it. And there are some houses on, on the market for $45 to $90 million. You look at the sheriff's office, the sheriff's office has a half a billion dollar budget. Look, I don't think there's too many departments that have somewhere around 550 or 580 um, million dollar budget, law enforcement. That's a pretty lucrative budget, huh? You're talking about a lot of money involved. You're talking about uh, a, a lot of power. And if you're not in their clique, then you're then you're a problem. Now the sheriff, the sheriff's job, and this is not written anywhere in a contract, but my feeling is that the sheriff's job is to protect the rich people who pay for his campaigns to be elected from us, from the normal people. Rick Bradshaw says his crime-fighting days are far from over. Hopefully the people of Palm Beach County will think that I'm doing a good enough job to be able to have me back. Rick Bradshaw was sworn in for the fourth time as Palm Beach County Sheriff. Sheriff, congratulations. Ah, so Sheriff Bradshaw is an interesting man. He's, he's been involved in so many cover-ups of deaths and other things. That, I mean, it's, it's really hard to count. You can take a look at the number of the number of unarmed shootings we've had in this county. We've had more unarmed shootings in this county than some states have had collectively. The sheriff has a lot of unwritten, untold, unseen powers. Can the sheriff the sheriff can go to Mar a Lago and say to Donald Trump, hey, we've got a problem here, let's do something. There, I've seen the sheriff and Donald Trump together before. They're friends. County Sheriff Rick Bradshaw had a chance to talk to President Trump about his local priorities and concerns. The two meeting today at Mar-a-Lago. He's a cowboy. He's been a cowboy from way back when. I know older officers that work with him at the city of West Palm Beach, and it was nothing for him to use the N-word, the word nigger. It came out of his mouth uh, like you say hello. Now with President Trump, uh, being elected and living here part-time in Palm Beach. Uh, there's, there's a lot of politics involved. There's a lot of money and power 
involved. Sheriff Rick Bradshaw, although he is a true real law enforcement person because he was a police officer for a long time, he's also a political person and he needs to be elected. You don't want to be elected after one of your cops just killed some guy for no good reason. The video was horrifying. It, it was really, I've only seen a couple other videos in my life were that brutal as far as cops and suspects. That's definitely in the top five. Well, my name is Don Trill. First name Don Trill. Last name Stevens. Um, pretty much everybody see me over the news and stuff. And uh, I'm 24. It's an extremely emotional time for him, as, as I'm sure you can just begin to imagine. Well, my life was kind of better than, you know, how it is now. I was, well, I wish, you know, I had the strength to walk again, you know, be able to complete a lot of more things in my life. And that's... The kid was not a threat. Anytime somebody is moving away from you, they're not a threat. You know, if he's unarmed, how much of a threat is he? Now, if you and me shoot some guy in the back, we'll probably get arrested. You, you can't shoot people in the back because they're fleeing. You gotta shoot them from the front, so at least turn the person before you shoot. And come true with unlimited plans and no annual contracts. That's something like that that's that story of something like I don't wanna talk about, explain about. It's just because it's it's something that's, you know, gets me I, I'm left me traumatized about that situation. So I don't really talk about this situation at all. All you have to do as a cop is say, I thought he was reaching for something in his waistband. So all you have to say, and you're free from prosecution. The sheriff shows up, oh, this is a good shooting. Uh, Dontrell Stevens is a drug dealer, bum, bum, bum. Who cares if he's a drug dealer? It doesn't matter. I will kill you. <laughs> I decided to get out of police work because, you know, it just wasn't what I expected. It wasn't what I wanted to do. After I left police work, I was determined to uh, start exposing, you know, what they were hiding from the regular American people. I started a website called PBSO Talk. It was a site where police officers from Palm Beach County could come on and post things that were happening in their department and post with absolute anonymity because one of the important things that I wanted to do uh, or make it impossible for anybody to find out who was exposing these crimes. So this is the front page of PBSO Talk and it's not just the sheriff's office. You'll see down here, you know, people are welcome to post again about uh, any law enforcement agency. So you have West Palm Beach Police Department, Jupiter, Point Beach. For instance, this topic here is uh, the admission from a confidential informant uh, to a detective on how the highest ranking people in, the, in Palm Beach County, not just the sheriff's office, but judges and other people, were visiting uh, a place of prostitution. Mark was a breath of fresh air for a lot of deputies because he did what a lot of people wanted to do but didn't have the heart or the intestinal fortitude to do, meaning he found a platform to expose the corruption. If you, if you look at it from a biblical analogy, Mark was the David, and he was fighting the Goliath. Would I have done what he did? 
No, but I also don't see anything wrong with people trying to let other people know the truth. You understand what I mean? And we all know that when you fight the powers that be and you get rid of some of their, you know, some of the veil that covers up their actions, they, they get a little pissed off. And I said, son, you keep taunting these guys. They've got a $500 million budget. They're gonna squash you like a bug. You know, I wish you'd stop. And then he said, Dad, I'm not gonna stop. I believe in what I'm doing. And I was like, okay, you know, it's your funeral, buddy. So in uh, 2012, I get a call from a bartender. I went online and I did a Google search uh, for PBSO corruption. And Mark Dugan's site came up. And I thought, well, here we go. Here's a site that's dedicated. <laughs> and this bartender says, hey, I have pictures that you have to see of somebody with the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office with a prostitute. My name is Gino Vincent DeFonzo, and uh, my connection to the, uh, the golf party back in 2005 is that I was a bartender and photographer uh, during the tournament. And I'm like, okay, come on over to my house, I'll take a look. I thought this guy was joking, or you know, maybe he was with some good looking girl um, who he just assumed was a prostitute. And at first he didn't believe me. He said, no, you can't have photos of us. Yeah, I do. He said, I want to see them. So I said, all right, we'll go ahead and go to this Flickr account and you'll, you'll see them. We copied the photos onto my computer and when I opened them up, I was absolutely shocked. And he looked and he said, oh my God, do you know who this is? Do you know? I said, yeah, I know who it is. He said, it wasn't just any person with the sheriff's office. It was the head of internal affairs, uh, Major uh, Robert Van Reet. He wasn't with just some random woman. He was with a totally stark, naked woman in the middle of a golf course. Yes, all those people were from law enforcement. They're groping this woman in the middle of a golf course, uh, surrounded by houses. I mean, it was just, to, to think that anybody would actually let their photos be taken. In between the photographs, she's snorting cocaine in front of everybody on the golf course. And I'm just like, geez. And he's like, yeah. But this wasn't just a cop. This was the guy that determines morality. And in fact, the, the boy who was 17 at the time he is now a, a PBSO deputy. <laughs> he became a PBSO uh, deputy shortly afterwards, so. He didn't get in any trouble, none. The sheriff swept it under the rug, said, well, you know, what these people do if they're not on sheriff's office time is their own business. First of all, they figured uh, that I would never release the photos because of who they were, because of the power positions that they, uh, that they hold. It was one of the most crazy things I ever saw in my life. God, I was a mess when I got here. I was a mess. I mean, I would just, like I don't cry. I didn't even cry when my mom died, right? I don't cry. When I got here, I was, I cried every freaking, probably every week I would just break down hysterical knowing that I didn't have my kids and uh, missing them. Wow. What is that? Yeah. Let me see. It's a gem. What's that over there? Huh? Whoa. I can feel it. Hold, let me see. Show it. Oh, isn't that awesome? Last year around Christmas time, I didn't even want to live. You know, it was so bad. And, um, you know, but 
but then, then somebody has to do it. Because if nobody ever stands up against government, then the government's always going to do whatever they want. And, you know, maybe I didn't make a huge impact, but even if I made a little, little impact, and other people made little impacts here and there, then at least it controls them a little bit. Honestly, I don't want to go back. My country betrayed me. Look, I was loyal to my country. And they freaking stabbed me. And they took away my kids, basically. Uh, for nothing more than basically telling the truth. They burned their bridge with me. I don't want to go back. I would go back to see my children. Um, but I don't want to... I have no desire to go back there to live. Now I'm legal in Russia. Luckily, Russia's so big that even Donald Trump couldn't build a wall here. The senior Palm Beach County police officer did not consent to this telephone conversation being broadcast. His side of the dialogue is summarized here. The PBSO deputy claims that Dugan constantly tells lies. He also asserts that Dugan himself is to blame for having to leave his family because of what he has done. The sheriff's office denies any responsibility for Dugan's enforced departure. Michael Gauger is the chief deputy of the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. Uh, he's been working for the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office since, I think, the 1970s. I mean, a really long time. Gauger is actually very knowledgeable when it comes to police. Gauger is not some dumb guy. He's very well educated. He probably should be the sheriff at the end of the day. And he's kind of created the entire culture of uh, what I call the culture of corruption. Uh, at the sheriff's office. I found uh, Mike Gauger is, is who ultimately pushed me out of police work. I, I've spoke to, to Mike Gauger. Unfortunately, I, I think um, Mike thinks he's been attacked by Mark, uh, and maybe rightfully so. Do you mean the pictures where the sheriff and chief deputy are depicted as Nazi leaders? The officer replied that those pictures were a very minor transgression, referring instead to pornographic images that he claimed Dugan had doctored to include senior officers' faces. Some of the, I'm sorry, I had to let, uh, some of the photos of, you know, uh, uh, Bradshaw bending over the chief and vice versa in uh, village gear attire. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I'm sorry, it's funny, but it's not so funny. Uh, his sense of humor, he's very witty. Uh, he's, he'll pull, he's a prankster as well. I would not have posted on there, and I didn't like I thought they were somewhat uh, juvenile, uh, childish. It takes attention away from the real corrupt activity, and it, it makes the chief look too much like a victim. The senior deputy claims that John Dugan frequently posts pictures online and then denies doing so. The, the, the photo was posted on my website. Uh, I'm not the originator of that, uh, uh, that photograph, but I kept it on the site at the top. Uh, and I kept it on um, because Bradshaw as Hitler and um, Gauger as Mussolini is very representative of who they are. Was Dugan responsible for those posts? I don't know. There is no way to know. I always post it under me. And when I'd call these, when I'd call Bradshaw or Gogger Crooked, I'd make sure that it came from my account. But how do you know that there was he and, and, and not some, somebody else? Because uh... the senior officer is quite certain that after six years of experiencing what he calls harassment, he's able to recognize Dugan's writing style. Don't forget that the sheriff and Gauger 
with all of their heirs are nothing more than employees of the people. And now we need to not make fun of them. They're laughable guys. You know, they're laughable. Thank you, sir. So we, we were trying to, uh, to ask him for an interview, uh, and, but he refused. Uh, but we had this rare opportunity to talk to a person who really, um, you know, uh, has a negative attitude to Tom Ardugan. I realized they were following me back in 2013. You know, I started seeing strange cars uh, pulling in front of my house, uh, people taking photographs. I knew I was under investigation when uh, the chief deputy, uh, Michael Gauger, went to uh, my wife's place of business to tell my wife to have me take down the website. They really wanted Mark Dugan, is what I believe, and they still do. They still want Mark Dugan. The police are already looking for him. They want him to do something because they just want to arrest him. And they just can't find something good enough, you know? But they just want to arrest him. He gave them a reason. We got 12,000 names. I published them all. It was uh, the names of local police, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach Police, PBSO. Broward Sheriff's Office, Miami Police, and FBI. That probably is the day he went too far. It's a felony, yes, published to the public. I'm against that, only because I don't want to endanger your life or anybody else's life. I don't want to do it. And as nasty and as disrespectful, unprofessional, um, as Rick Bradshaw and Mike Gauger, they are, I'm not going to stoop to their level to deal with them. The reason I did it, right, for me, well, it was playing by their rules. Whenever we have a, 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 a bad contractor or a person who attacks our, one of our judges or the sheriff or the state attorney, that's one of the things I do. I start picking their life apart and their businesses. Mm -hmm. There's a lot involved in these types of investigations. The issue is, uh, several things, just freedom of speech. There's a lot of things he does that he's protected, uh, unfortunately. Detective Kenneth Mark Lewis, he's a 20 or 25 year veteran of the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. He had retired um, back, I think, in 2005, but they brought him back on a part-time basis specifically to start a unit um, to investigate the sheriff's uh, uh, political enemies. So he was sort of like, you know, Harvey Keitel in Pulp Fiction. You know, he's supposed to clean up for the sheriff. And, you know, I don't think it worked that way because he admitted to everything when this female voice called him on the phone one day. So if someone attacks a judge, you might not be able to get him for the attack, but you can tear his can life apart until you find something. Yeah, and, right. and get him with that. That's right. Oh, oh, man. Do you want to know how I got Mark Lewis to believe that I was a woman? Let me show you how. Hello, Mark Lewis. My name is Jessica. I'm a beautiful woman, and I'm moving to your area soon. Let's meet. Hello, Mark Lewis. My name is Jessica. I'm a beautiful woman, and I'm moving to your area soon. Let's meet. I told him I was a woman moving down with my boyfriend, and, you know, I began flirting with him. If I ever wanted to go for a fast ride in a police car, <laughs> for a fast ride in a police car. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, here's my next question. Uh -huh. do, do you want to sit in the front or the back? <laughs> Apparently, he likes this woman, and they start talking for, like, hours, and he starts telling her all this stuff. He began flirting back, and I pretended like I was just this amazed young girl who was in awe over 
his skills and capabilities. For instance, that creep that uh, has that PBSO, the guy named uh, John Mark Dugan. Uh -huh. You know that we, he went to Russia and he started using this camera to take pictures. We had the pictures before he ever published them, and we knew where he was at. You're kidding me. Nope, had them. I could even tell you what f-stop he used on his camera and what the lighting was. This is really bad stuff. I mean, if the government can do this, it's, it's unbelievable. So many federal crimes here. Um, you know, but nobody ever held this guy accountable. It, it's weird that we have a journalist from a Russian news media outlet that's more interested in this than, than our own people here. You know, it was very entertaining. It was exactly what I said from the start, is that the sheriff has a political machine that is designed to keep him. Finally, the officer is adamant that he himself has not heard the 30-second recording. Even so, he's certain that Lewis would have been well aware that he was talking to John Dugan and not to a woman. For that reason, he deliberately talked trash. I think that he may, at one point, have figured out that he was getting set up, but probably not for the first four, five, six hours of their conversation. If, if Mark Lewis knew he was talking to Dugan, why did he tell him all this stuff? Why, why would tell, what did he tell him all this stuff? Because all the stuff he was telling me, I checked into it, they're all true. When he gets arrested, what, what jail do you think he's going to? He's going to ours. <laughs> oh he's an God. idiot. <laughs> so what the he hell? He's it's true. <laughs> but while you're being <sighs> held for trial, you stay in the county jail. It's our jail that the sheriff <sighs> runs and he picks on, and the undersheriff that he attacks. They're, oh. It's their jail. They're in charge. They could, they could make a phone call and be like, hey, put him in with the, the big pedophile at the end. Yeah, the big, big, huge black pedophile guy at the end. Yeah. There, Holy. Remember me telling you this guy's little? Yeah. Yeah, he's going to be somebody's girlfriend, whether he likes it or not. You hear recordings of, of police officers talking about how they're going to make sure he dies in prison and that they're going to put them down below with the child molesters. I mean, we heard recordings of that by known police officers. That's creepy. What would, uh, my only choice, I think, would be to haul out, right? I mean, what would you do? If you know you're facing imminent death, OK, just because they don't want you to talk anymore, what would you do, really? When my house was raided uh, by the FBI, I realized it was time to flee to flee the country. My kids had uh, just went off to school. When I walked into the front door, um, I noticed that there was a uh, black Ford pickup truck parked in front of my house. I figured something was up. So I put on a, I went back in and I put on the T-shirt and I walked out and halfway to the truck, the door opened, and it, it was a guy clad in a black vest who jumps out with his gun, and I had people jumping out of the bushes and coming from behind the house, just swarming me in all directions, saying, on the ground, on the ground, right? And they brought me to the back of uh, an FBI vehicle. I received a phone call. I said, Mr. Dugan, I said, yes. He said, this is agent so-and-so of the FBI. And we're here at your son's house, Mark, and we need you to come and pick him up. I'm just like, OK, yeah, yeah. You know, we'll set up a meeting. I'll tell you whatever you want to know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, they, hand they let me out of the handcuffs, and they told me to leave while they searched my house. I jumped in the car, ran up there, and there were police cars all over the place, FBI, sheriff's office. They, the FBI said they had 45 people go through their apartment. So my dad came picked me up, and uh, an FBI vehicle uh, followed us. 
uh, to my dad's, towards my dad's house. I just knew that I had to leave. I didn't have a choice. It was, uh, it was crazy. He was, he was terrified. He, he, he said, they'll kill me if they catch me. He asked me if I would see about trying to get his passport back. They could have very well have said, no, uh, we are not giving the passport back. And that would have been the end of it. However, they, they gave it back to me. Then I heard Mark was over in Russia. I decided I needed a uh, new way to escape. And uh, I went to my attorney's place and I gave him a package to send to my children because um, I didn't know what was going to happen to me, to be honest with you. In the package was a uh, letter and uh, a new tablet that I had gotten because, you know, the FBI, they took, uh, they took everything. They took my tablet, they, they took every computer that was in my home. Um, you know, so my kids didn't have any way to do homework, so I bought them a tablet as a gift. Sorry that I had to leave, and then I miss them so much. Yeah. It was really a terrible thing because, um, you know, they were young. I mean, they were six and eight at that time. They don't understand. How are they going to understand that their father just... just up and leaves them. Their father that they see every morning that loves them so much. And, uh, you know, even, even now, I mean, they don't understand the situation because they're too young. The last day I saw my children, I took uh, Aurelia into the bedroom and we took a little nap together and I gave her a hug. And she was laying there, she knew something was wrong. And I said, honey, I, I've gotta go and I'm not gonna be able to come back here. And it might be a very long time before I can see you again. And uh, we just sat there curled up on the bed crying, you know, both of, both of us. You know, I'm, I was looking at 35 years in jail if, if I didn't get murdered first. And, uh, you know, how do I explain to them, well, if I come home, you'll never see me because I'll be put in a prison somewhere if they don't have me killed. At this point, I had a truck that I hadn't registered in seven years. I had them leave it on the uh, north side of uh, Palm Beach Gardens Mall for me. I went to the Palm Beach, uh, Palm Beach Gardens Mall. I parked in the south parking lot. I went in through some stores. I went uh, into one of the dressing rooms of, I think it was like Dillard's or Macy's. I took a different way out of the mall and into the truck that was uh, parked there waiting for me and just started to drive north towards the uh, Canadian border. Leaving America was very tough. I couldn't fly out because my passport was blocked. I knew that the only way to get past TSA was to get into Canada without leaving through the normal channels. I called around to um, different places that rent airplanes and uh, I found a guy with a Cessna 172 who was willing to um, fly me around. I told him I was writing a book on plate tectonics and that I just had to fly over Canadian territory to uh, uh, photograph some GPS coordinates for the book. And then we would land in the U United States again. And that doesn't require uh, any clearance from uh, the TSA. And as soon as I got over uh, certain GPS coordinates, which I knew that there was a small airstrip, uh, I would fake a medical emergency. It was a heart attack. We landed, I jumped out of the airplane, I grabbed my bag, I threw the guy some cash, and uh, I took off. I went into the closest town, I 
took a bus to Toronto. From Toronto, uh, I took an airplane. I was just thankful to be here, quite honestly. I was, I, I landed in, in Russia and I was like, ah, oh, what, what a relief uh, off my shoulders to know that, uh, you know, I was at least going to be safe here. Здравствуйте, девяносто пять, I see you're screwing me up now. Девяносто пять, пожалуйста. Здравствуйте, девяносто пять on восемь. Um, uh, so I probably landed with six or seven hundred dollars, and uh, you know, at that point, I wasn't even thinking about um, work or where I was going to get money. I just knew that when I got here, I, I'd be okay. I've never felt unsafe in Russia, actually. For me personally, being in Russia um, feels safer than being in most safe cities in the United States. Uh, we're going to um, the uh, factory where my tables are manufactured in Solichnogorsk. I've just started a company called Bad Wolf. My company builds computer tables. I design them and build them. And when I say computer tables, they are tables with computer components integrated into the tables. This is the factory where uh, my tables are made. This is a very cool laser cutter. It takes this sheet and it, uh, a very fine laser beam and it cuts all around the metal. Gamers happen to love these computers. They've been used at many prestigious events for electronics here in Russia. Um, and I've shipped a couple of them uh, internationally too. So, you know, that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm writing a book at the moment. If you look, this is all laser cut, and even my logo is laser cut into the metal. So if you can see this, mm -hmm. Bad Wolf. Uh, and uh, so these are the studs, these are the legs for it. So, so it just fits on like, uh, like this. Well, it's, it's hard to do. Yeah, like that, see? And it's difficult because I can't, you know, I can't have a normal job. Like, I can't work for an American company uh, because, you know, once a company finds out that, you know, I fled the United States for political asylum, they're not going to hire me. I can't really work for a Russian company because I don't speak Russian uh, very well. So as, fine, as far as finding a stable job, it's, it's incredibly difficult. I've had people contact me, um, offer me ways to come back. I, I had one person offer me, you know, to tell information that I have, I might have about Russia uh, in exchange for, you know, uh, amnesty back home. I'm not gonna do it, you know. Look, R Russia was incredibly uh, generous and give me asylum here and um, for me you know it's my country now that's great Aurelia <laughs> oh don't hurt your ankle doing it on that mat in the grass it could catch your ankle oh wait she stepped in dog poop <laughs> Mark's mother died in uh last December on uh, Christmas Eve. When my mother died, my, my brother was devastated that he couldn't be here, you know. Um, they didn't always talk a lot, and sometimes they'd, they'd go back and forth. They'd fought a lot. Um, but in the end, you know, we're family. And, and uh, you know, because of what my government did, I wasn't able to go home and say my goodbyes. So I had to tell her goodbye over the telephone, which was difficult. Uh, and she died Christmas Eve. I had a very rare cancer called mantle cell lymphoma, which is a blood cancer. You know, with the sickness I've got right now, I can't travel. I don't think I'll ever see my father again. You know, yeah, he probably has maybe 10 years left, and I don't see him ever making the journey over here. Probably never see my aunt again. You know, I, I lost my entire family.
it's easy to say it wasn't worth it. It's very easy to say that. I don't know if that's true, you know? Because somebody's got to take a stand sometime. If nobody ever takes a stand against anything that's bad, the only place our world is gonna go is to a very bad place. My family doesn't understand the decisions that I made. Sometimes I don't understand the decisions that I made. But I think what I did was the right thing. No matter if it made a difference or not. I think it has made a difference though. That's not the kind of world you want to live in. It's not the kind of world that I want to leave to my children. Would I do it over again knowing what I've lost? I don't know if I would. But if you ask me if I think I did the right thing, yeah, I, I did do the right thing. Mark, I love you, man. And uh, I can't wait to have a beer with you, all right? Hopefully sooner than later. That's it, we good.